Judy. Nice job on all those medals and jewels. Did you did you practice that or did you already know how to do? You looked them up. Oh, just one. That's better. That's better than I would have had to do. You know, if you were in a cafe in England this morning and you ordered biscuits and gravy for breakfast, do you know what you would probably get? You might get a strange look, and you also might get a strange look followed by a ruined plate of cookies that had chicken stock, you know, dribbled all over the top of it. Because in England, when you want a cookie, you need to ask for a biscuit. Did you all, did you all know that? I'm telling you this this morning because the word heaven... In the Lord's Prayer, which we're studying right now, uh, is like that for many people. We hear the word and we think one thing, and Jesus says the word and he's thinking another. So before I go any further down this road, though, I know there's something important I need to name because the moment I start raising questions about heaven is the moment other questions start being raised about the afterlife and we start wondering about but what about our loved ones and what about where we go uh, when we die. We may not know exactly all there is to know about heaven, but what we know, well, that is a part of it. So if I tell you this morning that that is not exactly what Jesus was focused on when he talked about heaven, then the first place your mind may go is, well, are you, then are you trying to say that that place that we talk about going after we die, that the place we focus on it at funerals, that that doesn't exist? So let's go ahead and get this out of the way. I'm not saying that. Okay, I like my job. (laughs) But what I am saying is that when Jesus talks about heaven, that may or may not be what he is talking about, or at least part of it, not, not the whole of it. And it's hard for us to see this. It's hard for us to see that the Bible actually doesn't talk a lot about that place either, that place we go right after we die. And when the Bible does talk about it, it usually doesn't use the word heaven. No, instead, when Jesus was talking about that place with the thief on the cross, he called it paradise. Or Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, refers to it as being, quote, with the Lord. And and you'll likely find some places to challenge me on this, and we can talk about it later, but for the most part, our common ideas, our popular ideas about heaven are more Plato than they are Jesus. Which basically ends up meaning that when we hear Jesus say the word heaven in the Lord's Prayer, we likely hear it as if he's asking us to pray for a biscuit. And then we start salivating at the idea of, you know, Smucker's strawberry jam and butter sandwiched between two, you know, crispy pastries, when actually Jesus is intending to get us to ask God to pray for a fresh baked cook plate of chocolate chip cookies. Have I got your attention? Are you salivating? Are you confused? That may happen more than once this morning. So why is it important for us to wade into this right now? Because the Lord's Prayer is the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, and we ought to understand what we're asking for when we pray it. And that's what we're aiming for in this series, and that's what we're angling for this morning. See, um, some people, you may still do this, if they want to see if their spaghetti noodles are done, they'll throw wet, boiled noodles against the wall and see if they stick. And if they stick, they're done. Now, I know my kids are going to be wanting to throw noodles against the wall this week, but you know what I'm saying. So what I'm going to do this morning as we're talking about heaven is I'm going to throw some wet, boiled thoughts against the wall 
And some of them may stick and some of them uh, may not. They're probably not done, but they may help us think a bit more about what we're praying for when we pray this prayer to our Father in heaven. And those ideas are meant to help us wrestle with questions like, where is heaven? When is heaven? What does it mean for God to be in heaven? And what specifically is heaven? Now we've already mentioned some things that heaven is not. Here's one more thing. Heaven, especially as we usually describe it, is not the end game of the gospel. Leadership guru Stephen Covey in his book, Seven Habits of uh, Highly Effective People says we should begin with the end in mind. And if we think, if our end thinking, if we think that what God is after and what we're supposed to be after is this disembodied state that we'll live for eternity in, then we are beginning and living with the wrong end in mind and certainly not a Christian one. Much of the language of Revelation 21 is what we use to describe that disembodied heavenly state. Streets of gold, for instance. That one rings a bell. But Revelation 21 is not ultimately about heaven. It's, it's, it's about the end game of the gospel. Which is not about us going to heaven, but about God bringing heaven to earth and joining them together in a new creation. This is the end game that Jesus put into motion at Easter with his own embodied resurrection. Resurrection and new creation are the end game of the gospel. Revelation is a picture of what it will look like when the resurrection of heaven and earth are fully joined together once again. The rescue mission of Jesus is ultimately about God repairing rejoining and reconciling all of creation. And historically, Christians believe that's not just something that happens in the future, but it's also something that can happen here and now because that's exactly what Jesus taught and that's exactly what Jesus taught us to pray for. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, where? As it is in heaven. So where is heaven? Where is heaven? Where is heaven is actually a question that has a whole lot to do with what is heaven. Simply put, heaven, the Bible believes, (laughs) or seems to hold forth, is the place where God dwells. It's it's God's realm. Heaven is the place where there is no distinction between the wishes and the ways of God's reign and reality as it is experienced. Now, where is that? Is it up in the sky? Well, we haven't seen it through the window of any space shuttle. We, We haven't caught it through a telescope, so maybe it's not up there. But if it's not, where is it? And if heaven is the place where God dwells, does that mean that God doesn't dwell elsewhere? Like here? No, we don't believe that. We believe God is omnipresent or everywhere. So where is God and how can God be in one place or the other? How can God be in both heaven and earth as well? The answer has a lot to do with the nature of heaven. Not as a place where it can be found on a global map, but as a separate and yet overlapping dimension. This is a really kid-friendly sermon we're preaching here. How shall I describe this? If I had a whiteboard, I might draw two overlapping circles. One would be heaven and one would be earth, and you would see that there were places where heaven and earth overlap. Two distinct overlapping dimensions. This is what N.T. Wright is referring to in the quote on the front of your worship guide today. You might read it with me. The pictures of heaven in the book of Revelation have been much misunderstood. The wonderful description in Revelation 4 and 5 of the 24 elders casting their crowns before the throne of God and the Lamb beside the sea of glass 
is not a picture of the last day with all the redeemed in heaven at last. It is a picture of present reality. The heavenly dimensions of our present life. Heaven in the Bible is not a future destiny, but the other hidden dimension of our ordinary life. God's dimension, if you like. God made heaven and earth. At the last, God will remake both and join them together forever. And when we come to the picture of the actual end in Revelation 21 and 22, like we heard a moment ago, we find not ransomed souls making their way to a disembodied heaven, but rather the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven to earth, uniting the two in a lasting embrace. And this wasn't a new idea for early Christians either. They'd already seen glimpses of it in the Hebrew scriptures. For instance, in Genesis chapter 28, where Jacob sees that ladder, that stairway going from heaven, and angels are going to and fro back from heaven to earth, and Jacob says, surely the Lord was in this place, and I did not know it. Or in 2 Kings chapter 6, when Elisha and his servant are in that house and they're scared to death, Elisha's servant is anyway, because he looks outside and there's an army surrounding the house and he thinks they've come to, to, to take them and to, and to kill them. And he comes back to Elisha and he's, he's scared out of his mind. And Elisha says, don't worry. Those who are with us are more than those who are for against, against us. And Elisha's servant goes back to the window and sees an army of angels surrounding them, ready to protect them. This is the idea. So how does it work? What wet, boiled, hot noodles might we throw up against the wall to describe it? Well, I'm sure this is going to clear things up for you. But I spent the week thinking a whole lot about Christopher Nolan's movie Interstellar which is a movie about how Matthew McConaughey saves the future Earth by discovering a way uh, to uh, enter the fourth and fifth dimension, okay? And, and at the end of the movie, at the end of the movie, McConaughey is in this place beyond time where he uses gravity to communicate with his daughter in a different time and space that was actually still somehow presently connected to, to the other time and space. Does it all make sense now? Imagine being in another dimension in the future that's not really the future and using gravity to tap out a message to your daughter in a slightly affected East Texas accent that everything is going to be all right, all right, all right. No? Well, if not, then perhaps think Chronicles of Narnia and accessing another world through a wardrobe. Or think Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse where the characters cross into parallel worlds and, and then even sometimes when they cross into those worlds they become different versions of themselves like they look like Picasso or their live action. Or if that doesn't do it for you, maybe think about John Krasinski's current movie which is in the theater If about imaginary friends who are all around us in this ra reality but can only be seen and experience through eyes and hearts that believe. These are, you know, in my mind I understand it, I feel like, but it's more like a picture, a portrait, than it is a proposition. These are only slightly sticky noodlings of how the realm of heaven might be both distinct from our reality and yet presently all around us as well, just like, God. In fact, Jesus suggests heaven is not just a near reality that will one day be united when earth and heaven come together in the new creation, but one that can already be accessed, shared, and received right now. Now, how does that work? Well, the biggest way it works is in and through Jesus. In the Old Testament, the Israelites believed that the tabernacle or the temple was the place where heaven and earth most fully overlapped, where heaven and earth most fully met, which is important to know because in John chapter 1, in the prologue of John, 
when he describes Jesus as the Word who was God and who was with God and through whom and for whom all things were made. And then he says, and the Word became flesh and, in the Greek, it says, tabernacled among us. Which was John's way of letting us know right up front that Jesus is the ultimate tabernacle. Jesus is now the place where heaven and earth most fully meet. Jesus is the new temple. Jesus is the fullest manifestation of the heaven and earth overlap. If we want to see what it would look like for things to be on earth as they are in heaven, we look at Jesus. And if we want to experience it, we can do that in, through, and with Jesus. Jesus is the one who our loved ones are fully with now. And Jesus is the place where heaven and earth most fully meet. Jesus is the one who will bring heaven and earth together in the new creation. And Jesus is the one who wants to bring heaven to earth for you, in you, and through you so that you can experience God's full and abundant life right here, right now. In fact, that's exactly what he said. In John chapter 10, he said, The reason why I came is so that you might have life and that you might have it to the full. And that is why Jesus started off his ministry proclaiming in Matthew chapter 4 that the kingdom of heaven has come near. Some will say you can find it over here and you can find it over there. Look for it here. Look for it there. But I tell you the truth, the kingdom of heaven is in your midst. And if it is, where is it? How do we get to it? How do we experience it? How do we receive it? Most of our conversations about heaven are, are focused on questions about who gets in and who doesn't get in, which is really honestly, a big adventure in missing the whole point of the gospel, which is far less about getting us into heaven than it is about getting heaven into us and into our world. That's what Jesus taught us to pray for, right? And how does that happen? It happens each and every time one of us chooses to open our hearts and our lives to let Jesus in, so that the realm of our heart and the realm of our lives can also be the realm where God is and God rules, which is the realm of heaven. That's how it happens in us. How does it happen through us? Well, Jesus gives us a pretty big clue in Matthew's Gospel in that section of the Sermon on the Mount, actually the sermon's opening, which we often refer to as the Beatitudes where Jesus talks about what it really means to be blessed. Remember? Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So how does God's kingdom break forth into our world? Perhaps with each and every act of mercy. Perhaps with each act of humility. Perhaps each time we embody peacemaking, God-seeking. Perhaps every time we embody one of those things, we're participating with heaven and some bit of heaven breaks into this world with you, through you, and then to the world around you. Somehow, by participating in the kingdom of heaven in the way Jesus taught us to, we cross over into another dimension. God's dimension. And somehow, that dimension crosses over into us and through us. Or in other words, in Christ, you can be one of those places where heaven and earth meets. In Christ, you can be one of those places where heaven and earth meets. And when you are, 
when we are, well, that's when the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray is answered. Amen.